That was a threat. Welcome to our uh, starting on time punctual session uh, titled, We're in the Alamo and Down to Our Rifle Butts, which may or may not be a metaphor. It's up to you to decide whether it, it is. And by way of introduction, this is us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, uh, Jeff Gressler, Tony Wood, and we are uh, going to be slain to the last man, as it turns out, uh, <clears throat> because we feel that there actually is uh, an assault. Not, not only is preservation not winning. Uh, and moving forward, but we feel that there is an active assault on preservation in the city that has gotten worse under our progressive administration, worse than it ever was under the capitalist so administration of Michael Bloomberg. So that is the thrust of our uh, presentation, and we hope you find grounds to disagree. This is our situation. <laughs> Okay, one, we have no friends, and if we do have friends, they do not identify themselves. Two, there are no media outlets that publicize, publish, or support any pro-preservation agenda. You know, that said, though, I've been able to get the occasional op-ed in the Daily News, or someone else will get a letter in, but as a sustained outlet, there is nothing in the city of New York that really, uh, when, when many of us began doing preservation, uh, before some of you were born, uh, there were media outlets that had Oomph. And today, that is no longer the, the case. Three, we have not only no friends in government, we have active enemies in government. And I think that if we are going to uh, engage in preservation advocacy, we have to stop pretending that the people on the other side opposing us just don't know enough about preservation, because otherwise they would be our friends. No, we have actual enemies. And the fourth point, of course, is self-explanatory. I mean, just look around. OK, one exception. <laughs> I, I see two exceptions in this room, OK? They dyed two. their hair, though. They, they dyed, dyed their, their hair. hair. The next generation of preservationists is going to carry this torch forward. Uh, <laughs> so I'm laying this out as the situation and this is the conclusion. The Alamo is doomed, said Sam Houston. Uh, in other words, as far as I can tell, help is not on the way. It's not like the extra army that Sam Houston has is going to ride into the public arena and be the reinforcements that preservation needs at this moment. This is our depiction. Jeff, you're asking everybody to leave now. Yeah. No, no. You have to be really despairing and destroyed without any hope. You have to be on the floor with your soul oozing all of its vitals. OK, time for plan B. Uh, let's see. Well, I think we can declare victory and go home. Two, call a timeout. OK, time out, Mexicans, time out. No, or three, bring in the consultants. <laughs> OK, I think most preservation organizations faced with this very scenario would do C, bring in the consultants. What will they tell us? Doesn't look good. <laughs> And we do have serious issues of concern that each have a preservation dimension to it. One, zoning for dollars in the new Midtown rezoning. 
namely that the city has an interest in the de demolition of the historic city because every time they're gonna put up a new big building like one Vanderbilt, the city is going to get a cut and the city has been unfunding what it needs in that Midtown neighborhood in order to wait until they get these private sector dollars. That's one way of looking at it. Uh, two, the backlog. One, they wanted to throw everything out, and two, they didn't even designate everything that was on there. Why did they leave certain things out? Why, for example, did they not designate rooms designed by Alvar Alto? Where you got married. Where I got married, where I got my wedding reception. I you took one the for the team. You gave the best <laughs> You know, I... <laughs> And I was married by one of the members of the Landmarks Commission. He was our minister. <laughs> I mean, talk about... <laughs> okay, uh, why are they holding back on some of, the, some of those worthy, worthy, worthy designations? Three. I thought those were our chocolates. They're all yours. Oh, good. Three. <laughs> More than ever in the decisions of the Landmarks Commission, the concept of owner consent has been creeping into designations and preservation practice issues. And the issue of owner consent is not in the law, but it has become to the forefront of the way the commission practices. And just for those of you who thought it could not get any worse, Reinforcements for the Mexicans have arisen over the hill, and the new designation report for the uh, Sullivan Street, Thompson Street Historic District includes language which had never been in any designation report before, and that is the issue of contributing and non-contributing, which is going to lead to enormous problems for the regulation and protection of buildings within historic districts. And they've done this just like that, because they wanted to. What's the political climate? Number one, we have an actively anti-preservation mayor. It's not a fact that he just doesn't understand. No, he sees preservation as the enemy. It's a convenient enemy. Secondly, the city council. Please. Does, I mean, when, whenever we raise the issue, it's, no, no, we have, no, that person's good on the city council. That person's good. There's always this one or that one from time to time good. But there is no preservation caucus in the city council. And in fact, there is an active anti-preservation caucus led by the progressive wing of the city council. The progressive caucus is the anti-preservation caucus. Even with, even, okay, Danny Drum is, is an exception in Jackson Heights, but still. And we have no, as, as I said, as Sam Houston said, help is not on the way. There is no Sam Houston. That's right, I'm sorry. <laughs> help is not on the way. Of all of the individuals running potentially for public office, which one of these individuals would be a friend of preservation? Certainly not Scott Stringer, maybe, probably not Tish James, depending. I mean, Hillary she, Clinton would. Hillary Clinton would. She had the Save America's Treasures. I think Tish James might be. Maybe. Because of her, her action around uh, you know, the stadium, etc. She has yeah, been, exactly. but she has been public advocate, a protected office, and she has said buckus about preservation. And that is a platform on which she could be speaking. OK, losing the battle. I mean, we have a lot of ammunition in preservation. We all know why preservation benefits the city. Uh, and the National Trust has a new book, Why Preservation is Beneficial for the Future City. And none of those arguments are mainstream in the political debate these days. We have to refight for each one of those trenches at this point. One, and that's foremost, in an administration and a political climate that's dominated by identity politics, what do we have? 
we're white, we're educated, we're wealthy, we're elitist. Yeah. <laughs> All, you know, uh, when the Furman Center started doing a, a survey of preservation, I, we sat down and I said, look, you're going to find out that, that it's whiter, more educated, wealthier. I mean, and, and the property values are higher. I mean, you're going to find that. How, and it wasn't always that way, as we know, but that is how it has become in the city because of property values. Second, affordable housing. Let me get through these, and then you can, then you can use your bayonets. And affordable housing. Why is affordable housing the albatross around the neck of historic preservation and not the Real Estate Board of New York? Three, gentrification. As a historian who understands what New York City was like in the 60s and 70s. I am a great fan of gentrification because gentrification saved the historic neighborhoods of New York City. What they are calling gentrification today is new construction and tall buildings. That is not gentrification. So again, gentrification is evil in the way the word is used and we are at fault. Who in academia is speaking for preservation? We have anti-preservation voices like Tom Agnani from uh, Hunter College, who's always speaking about how preservation is a burden for low-income minority communities, blah, blah, blah. I mean, and he is completely wrong and ideological, yet his ideas have more currency than any pro-preservation academics. Name a pro-preservation academic whose arguments are in the public realm. <laughs> Andrew, this isn't Andrew. This isn't an attack on you. <laughs> okay. Even when there's good news, pro-preservation stuff, it gets lost. It gets buried. Last year, the Landmarks Conservancy issued the most wonderful report about the benefits of preservation in New York City, and what was the result? How many of you have that report? How many times was that re Oh, you, yeah, but you're like, yeah, business. You have to have it. <laughs> you know, but the, the idea is, why wasn't that picked up anywhere? Why weren't those ideas aggressed? Why didn't the New York Times have an editorial saying what great arguments this is about why it's beneficial? Because in the 1980s, they would have. And of course, the Furman Center at NYU is the think tank for real estate. I like some of the people personally at the Furman Center. They're very smart, but the reports that come out of there are used by the real estate board to enhance development and counter preservation. And this is our problem. We've saved the Alamo over our dead bodies. <laughs> and it's very pretty. It belongs to the past, it's nicely landscaped, but really, it has nothing to do with the living city, the contemporary city, and you can see behind in San Antonio, that's the real city, that's the city they want, and as long as preservation is confined in this little landscaped plot, it's cute and nice and we'll accept it. But the idea that preservation is part of the living city is the argument we make, and we live, but it's not the argument that city fathers, mothers, and others embrace. Did I get it right? Got it right. Uh, <laughs> why don't you go back to the first slide, and I'm going to say a few remarks. It'll get those razor blades away from your wrists for, <laughs> just, just for a little longer. Uh, just for a little longer. Uh, the good news is we don't have to deal with the attack on the Constitution, immigration, and other national issues. So we've got to put this in, in context. Uh, first, just kind of some 30,000-foot stuff following on Jeffrey. And where this is going to go, because I'm going to talk for about five minutes, is opening this up for the happy news, which is going to be the ideas from you on how we address the situation. Because I think some of the smartest minds in preservation are in this room. And that's just the people I know. And the smarter minds are probably people I don't know sitting in this room who are new to preservation. 
So just a quick assessment again on where are we with advocacy. If you go to the policy level, kind of 30,000 feet, sadly, at best, our idea of success has been fighting off bad ideas. I mean, that's kind of the game we've been in for decades. Uh, and sadly, we've now failed at that. Intro 775 got through. In a sense, it was one of the big, it wasn't perhaps the end of the world in what it affects, but it was a big loss in a sense that it was something we all said was really bad and we couldn't convince enough of our friends to hold it off. Uh, we are politically outgunned. It is getting politically more a factor in preservation. There's always been politics, but it's been totally ratcheted up. Uh, so in a sense, success for us has been just holding off the bad stuff. We haven't really had a chance or the capacity or the inclination maybe to advance a big vision for preservation. I mean, where are our policy, our policy ideas to make preservation better? Probably the last improvement was the 1973 amendment to the Landmarks Law. By the way, this is all meant to be provocative and I can be corrected when we open this up because I'd like to be convinced of other things. But in a sense, where is our big vision? We're also not playing the long game. We've been so conditioned to response, to, to, to respond to the immediate crisis. We're a bunch of Dalmatians. The alarm goes off, we ring, we run out, we try and stop the fire, we try and save the building that's threatened, and we've been pretty good over time with that, but as a result, we don't play the long game. We're not advancing or repositioning ourselves for long-term wins. Uh, so I just put out there, success cannot be defined as just stopping the bad, uh, because over time, you're just gonna lose. When it comes to specific battles, I think we've done pretty, pretty well. We've gotten things designated, but the big challenge now is designation is being devalued. More and more things are being preserved, and designation means less and less when you look at what's going on with a regulatory situation. So if you look at, at the preservation advocacy landscape, we've got three really solid citywide preservation groups, uh, or groups that some dabble in preservation, others are real preservation groups. Uh, they work best when under attack which is maybe why we're not so good advancing positive things. We can certainly galvanize when we understand that the Alamo is directly under attack, but trying to muster those forces in a positive, proactive agenda to get new policy ideas out there, we really haven't been that successful. And I know we all feel we're undercapitalized, but if you go to uh, guidestar.com and you look at the 2014 990s for six preservation groups that I looked at, there's over $10 million in the preservation sector. So you might ask yourself, are we getting $10 million of preservation? We can debate that. So what we need to do, I think, is we need to start looking for new ways of doing things and ask ourselves the question, are we doing preservation advocacy the same way we've been doing it for the last 40 years and the world has changed and we haven't changed effectively? I think we need to get those long game ideas. Maybe we need to start a 501c4. Maybe we need a PAC. Maybe we need to be able to create some new tools that allows us to fight effectively in a new world situation. I think we are locked in the preservation that I came to in, 19, in New York in 1978. And it's kind of, we're doing the same stuff. Uh, and it's worked for a while, but I would argue it is not working now. We'll see if others, others agree with that. I think we need big new substantive ideas to be fighting for. There should be a demolition tax in New York City. If there was a demolition tax in New York City, that would have a very interesting impact. For one thing, it would, we could pretend we're being green so they wouldn't think it was a preservation bill. <laughs> <laughs> we could even bring in some allies in putting it forward. What about a mansion tax, a land transfer tax in New York where 0.0001% of every transfer, let's say over $2 million so it doesn't, you know, hurt normal New Yorkers. Uh, and if that pot of money was allocated, as it is in other parts of New York State that have this, you could have a pot of money that would help nonprofit owners of landmarks. So you don't need to play air rights games to help those buildings. You'd actually have a pot of money. That exists as an idea in other places. What about local tax incentives? Since where are our positive agenda ideas? Yes, they're gonna take time to happen. The landmarks law took 40 years. Uh, if you go back to when certain people imagined it early, early on. So in a sense, big ideas take time. We, don't, we haven't conditioned ourselves for the long game to think proactively. We're so into the responsive mode. So that's where we are. Now we've got, how do we get out of that? 
How do we get out of that? The good news is there are probably more New Yorkers aware of preservation than ever before. There are probably more people who care about preservation than ever before. There's certainly you know, the 100 plus historic districts. I mean, in a sense, there is potentially an army of people out there, but they're not here. They're not here today. Uh, I, I don't have the figures, but the attendance today is probably not that much larger than the first conference 23 years ago. Uh, and I see some voices from 23 years ago when we started this, and I'm glad we're alive to tell the tale. Uh, but in, the, in a sense, you know, we're, we've got to get into preservation for the next cycle, you know, the next decade. So we're now going to move and just open this up for your mad conversations with the hope that maybe some ideas will come forward or people can go back and do we need to go back and shake up the organizations we're involved with? Do we need new organizations? What's the answer? And I'm going to I'm going to go around like this for the first wave of recognizing people. Jeffrey, why don't you come down here so you can take some of the bullets? Um, <laughs> <laughs> roll up, roll up a chair, Jeffrey. We'll start, we'll start here. I'm not going to sling any bullets at you, but uh, uh, State of New York and the Roosevelt Island Operating Corporation. And these state entities that don't give up properties that they do not know what to do with, they book out on everything. This, I'm talking about the small pond hospital in Roosevelt Island. You can Google it while we're talking. And it is a James Wood building, falling apart, been temporarily stabilized three or four times. I think it's been bubbled up. And they just would not have a thing of giving it up and giving it to a not for profit, giving it to someone who really wants to do something with it. You know, I don't have to keep Charles Silver and I don't have to keep um, Walter Melvin in business with reports about this building. They, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is so frustrating to call them yeah. consultants. But, but I'm going to challenge us because, in a sense, when we're in these groups, naturally, we all go back to the thing we're most personally fighting for. And you've been fighting valiantly for Roosevelt Island for years. I think we've got to figure out how we get above those fights to move the needle in a bigger way. Because I think there's lots of energy. It's dispersed. We can't stop that. You've got to keep fighting. But how do we get above those individual fights so we can actually change the landscape? That Asking a big question on that topic would be, how do we hold the city and the state accountable for preserving their own historic structures. Yeah. How can yeah, yeah. we be more right. aggressive right. in pushing for that? Because Roosevelt Island was a marvelous opportunity for adaptive reuse, and it was just almost clear cut. It was almost bulldozed with a couple of redwoods still standing here and there. But the idea, but how and sea view. Yeah. So the idea, I mean, instead of asking, why is the smallpox hospital a ruin? It's why smallpox and sea view and the New York State Pavilion in the, in the Flushing Meadows Corona yeah. Park and any others? Tea building. The tea building. But I think the, the, the big point is, is how do we use those as poster children for the larger underlying issue, which I think in, in this case you pulled out back there and then we're going around. I want to say that I think it's <coughs> the fact that they say that preservation leads to white, does that mean it's true? And so the thing, a lot of things that are being said are not necessarily true. And we have to find ways to work with other neighborhoods like East New York, Bushwick, uh, Bedford Stuyvesant, these are not white neighborhoods and they're looking for preservation. Maybe the language is different, but I know that my councilman in Bay Ridge met with Jamani Williams together about illegal conversions because people died on that site. And we came from both neighborhoods together. We have to find ways to make the other side heard and to have the truth out. Because just because someone says it doesn't mean it's true. We have to stop feeding into that language. One of the worst <clears throat> One of the worst falsehoods that the political establishment in this city supports and pushes is that preservation is white and elitist. Oh, but you and, and, that. and <laughs> also that it is no benefit to minority communities. Right, but they're also using that argument to hurt minority communities. Okay. Of course. Tell me. And, and they are operating against the interests of the people in those neighborhoods who want historic preservation. Those voices aren't heard, but you do hear, I mean, Harlem is a disgrace. And I'll say that even if Michael Henry Adams isn't here. I mean, the, the, the way Harlem political establishment 
and the Abyssinian Baptist Church have betrayed what happened on in their exact block. I mean, the, the Renaissance Ballroom was being demolished by neglect. The when the commission came to designate that, Mayor Dinkins and the rest of the Harlem political establishment testified against it, and the Abyssinian Church, which owned it, said, we promise we'll do blah, 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 and the commission backed off. Now, they did not do it, and in fact, I went up there and said, oh, I'll take a look at the Renaissance Ball Renaissance Ballroom, where the Harlem Wrens, the great basketball team of the 1920s and 30s played, and I'll go take a look at it. You know what? It's around the corner from the Abyssinian Baptist Church. It's not in the middle, it's on their block. And across the street from them are two vacant lots in the middle of where tenements were that say Abyssinian Baptist Church, affordable housing, something you want soon. So we have to realize that we are not the white elitist evil people that we are portrayed as but this is a truly grassroots issue that hurts communities. Okay, yeah. moving, moving, moving along. Side. Moving along, a second row, wait, wait, lady, and then in back. Um, Sorry, see you. Jeff, we talked about owner opposition influence in LBC. This past week, I was down at a city council subcommittee hearing on potential designations. These are designations approved by LBC, but now moving for approval by the city council. A house on Staten Island, built in the late 1600s, the owner objects to landmarking, even though it does pristine restoration to the drop. The council member was there and, of course, supports that owner, that building, likely, because city council votes with right. the member that 1600s building is not going to be designated. No, that's part of, I mean, that is part of the kind of operational rewriting of the landmarks law to require owner designation. And the fact that the city council is acting that way is a real problem. I think that's one of the issues that we have to figure out. How do, how do we get above that? Is it developing a, um, you know, a, a, a small group of council members who are willing to stand up? Is it creating a, a political action committee so that Staten Island city council member can say, well, you know, this citizen looks pretty interesting, but they just got a donation from the preservation pack. I mean, we have to start playing serious if we want to win. It's a highly politicized situation, you know, and I think we need to be moving or thinking about moving in that direction. We're going to do a sweep and come back. Can I just add to that? Yeah. Uh, yeah ju question. No, what jump in. What's even rarer is that, that it got to the city council at all. Because exactly. the LBC is now um, self-vetoing things, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. this was a building mm -hmm. that the chair did not want to put up for a yep. public hearing, but three of the council, three of the landmarks commissioners insisted, uh, and they overrode her. So she she was already saying, no, the owner's opposed to it, so we're not even yeah. going to consider it. But, but historically, we should also, this isn't the first time that the commission has self-edited. I mean, back with the Board of Estimate, you know, when they knew the borough president wasn't going to pass it, they didn't. So, I mean, it's how do we change the political equation? Uh, and hopefully, one of the people I will recognize will have an answer to that. Here, here, and I'm sorry, here and then there. So, I, I just, you know, I don't, so I yeah. just want to add on. No answer, answer. next? We're, no, no, no. <laughs> well, okay. let, me, let me put two things before you. One is very nettling to me, that um, one of our great friends from the city council, Tony Avella, uh, whom I like personally, and I, I first heard him at one of these conferences, uh, is now in the state senate, and he is what I call a rogue Democrat. You know, right. some called independent caucus. So in practically everything else, politically, I'm not with him. And, you know, this bothers me that one of our greatest friends is politically not with the rest of my politics. Why do you, you think know? the Democrats are our friends? Well, they, my friend, I'll just say, I'll just say personally, that, that uh, it, there's just, you know, make, I think this is true for many of us, that there is this 
place where our two agendas don't come together. Our agenda for you know, those things that could be called roughly progressive politics, including affordable housing, and preservation. We think, I mean, we have very good authority, we think they can come together, but somehow ideologically, they're very much pulled apart. And that brings me to this other point, which is we had the media very much on our side when we were in when, uh, but we had the media very much on our side when we were trying to get Huntington Hartford heard, if not yep. designated. And is Christopher in the room? Yes. Yeah. Which yeah. Was. yeah, I remember you did that wonderful hearing in absentia. And I, I'm wondering if we, you know, we, we can't get the Times or you know some other big media outlet to do something similar. They ran a series of stories on LBC around the time. One of the larger challenges for us is media has changed. I mean, in the 1980s, and there was a different way media worked, and we were able to work the media to our cause. That, that's a big issue that was for us. Going to the 2000s. No, even even right. Okay, and I'm the gonna, New I'm, York I'm, Times no. has changed. At a, yeah. the New York Times is not a friend of preservation. Right. I'm going to challenge people now. In in people, I'm going to recognize. Instead of this being just a good 12-step session where we all... <laughs> Jeffrey's had a lot of good therapy in this session so far. What I'd like to challenge people to do is, is take whatever your concern is and try and package it in a, what if we did this? You know, well, we, I, let's try and just get above our, our therapy of getting venting out there. So I'm going to recognize... If you could live up to the challenge, you're next. So I'm new to all this. This is my first fair. I'm new to preservation group called Safe Chelsea, uh, which I admire immensely. The work they've done has been valuable and inspiring. But, um, so I'm hearing about all these organizations for the first time in a lot of cases. And the thing with that just jumps, and maybe this is really naive and I'm prepared to hear that. I was like, why, why aren't y'all working together? I mean, why don't you just share your media contacts? Why don't you make some priorities among your priorities and all go fight for that list of priorities? Uh, we'll, we'll let that... We'll We'll let that hang there. I mean, I think, you know, in defense of the existing preservation groups, there's an, there's an awful lot of coordination on issues and sharing of information. There's not enough, but let's, let's assume for a moment that they had complete coordination. Would the New York Times be covering us? No. I mean, since I know the groups, I know their contacts. They don't have the, it's, it's not that they haven't put those contacts together. In a sense, we haven't figured out how to get our issue to be recognized. There can always be more coordination, absolutely. But it's also very hard to ask people to prioritize when most people come to preservation from a site-specific thing. So like, Chelsea is your baby, Roosevelt Island is your baby, and that's gonna be your first priority. So it's hard to get people to, to go to the next level of systemic change. But, I gotta tell you, I come from the library world. And I come from the business library world, uh, rather than the public or the academic. But these are people who know, you know, everybody knows what their issues are. Censorship, freedom to, to read what you need to read. That's not true here. Well, I, I, well, actually, there's I a parallel like, in the library world, being a librarian, and that is that, uh, into that in world. the librarian world, um, the elected officials are redefining what the city needs in terms of libraries, but they're not talking to librarians. They're not talking to librarians about how people use the library. In the same way, in the same way, the city of New York is not listening to the people in the neighborhoods when they say they want preservation or a special kind of zoning or anything else because in the same way the city is redefining libraries. Anyway, Chris. Okay, Chris, and then next, lining them up. Uh, I, I just want to bring Remy back into this. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> the Mexicans. <laughs> I just paid my Remy dues last week for all $400. Siphoned off from thousands and thousands of agents across New York City, um, and they do nothing for us um, as brokers. So I'll tell you the attitude that real estate brokers have of revenue is overwhelmingly negative. <laughs> um, 
So you're not alone. Um, <laughs> and I think that given the issues of the previous election cycle, we need to follow what the stories are that are interesting. We can't go to the New York Times with a crumbling old building that don't care anymore. Local reporters are saying everyone is reporting on politics and in many cases on national politics. You can talk to DNA Info in Crown Heights and they'll probably tell you that, or you can talk to your reporters in your local neighborhood, that's what they're concerned with now. So if we take the cues and we consider how much damage Remini has done to my credit card statement this month and to our communities and to our zoning and how much money they allocate and they in fact sometimes steal from us without telling us where our donations are going and to what packs they're being um, you know, diverted to. If we looked at campaign finance reform on a state level and instead set all of our buildings and our preservation issues aside for just some time um, without you know, completely forgetting about it and letting the bricks fall off the buildings and said, let's focus on investigating every single next election cycle and where every single dollar is coming from to every one of our elected officials. And we as a preservation community became election watchdogs or started tying things back into where money is coming from, we might get that media attention. Follow and the money strategy. We follow the money, and we also take a look at Revney as an obsolete organization that is not serving the people that are paying it the most money. If you turn the brokers on Revney, which could happen soon, it, it could turn things in our direction. Revney insurgency, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm new to all this, too. I'm from uh, Richmond Hill, I have two gardens on. Seems like a, an issue of me of uh, messaging and branding. And then thinking back to what made Trump win in this election, he may have been the lesser qualified candidate, but he had a, a message that was simple to convey, easy, quick, people liked it, it's build a wall, like, and then a ton of scapegoats. But it's like, make America great again and build a wall. We need something like that, and I think we need to step more to the left than the, the progressive, the Democrats of the city who, who, you know, embrace all these progressive causes. And I mean, they sound great, we're all for it, affordable housing and everything. We have to change the message, change the, the wording of it. Make, and I think, see what I'm thinking back to is in, when Jackie Kennedy, right, say, helped save Penn Station, right? I mean, Grand she Central. did, uh, Grand Central. Penn Station was obviously demolished. But, but that's the thing, there was a one huge like thing that everybody rallied around. What was it in this election cycle? It was, the Mexicans are taking our jobs. You know, it's not even, or like, build a wall, just one thing that's so huge and empowering to everybody, and then they actually got to save Grand Central Terminal. So, well, you don't I mean, have to we, tell the truth, right. so that might make it very <laughs> 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 no, we're, all, we're all in our, you said it just now, we're, we all have our priorities. Yeah. My priority is my neighborhood, you all have Chelsea and, I don't know, Upper West Side, whatever. But we need to rally around one cause, which will get so much attention, just like it did in the 60s around Penn Station. Not successful, but it did create this whole movement which we have now, we've inherited it. It's in pieces, uh, bits and pieces. But I think it's just a terms of marketing strategy. I, I know a lot of young people, and I think the issue is, as you said, the age issue. In my own community, I've had to fight against these civic groups, associations that are run by 80 and 90 year olds. I'm 20, 23 years old, it's like, they don't want to see me because they're like, oh, he's gonna, I don't know, crazy youngster. <laughs> It's like they don't want to do anything anymore. If you're not going to help save our neighborhoods or like, I don't know, teach about history, do something, outreach, community outreach, just step out of the way. There's a lot of people who want to help, you know? Yeah. I mean, and, and I know I went to a, a leader's progressive school, Vassar, and I know many of my like classmates are very passionate about these issues, but they go back to their communities. They're faced with these like, uh, uh, like super old people who don't even use emails anymore. It's so hard to communicate with them. Can I ask what you consider super old? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jeffrey, no more carrier pigeons with your messages. As they're over, we've got a hand, we've got a hand here, and then we'll jump back over here. Uh, I'm super old <laughs> <laughs> and proud of it. I bet. But I do use email, and I have a couple things I want to offer. I pretty much feel like a Dalmatian, but. Um, I will offer that I serve on Community Board 5, uh, Manhattan's Community Board 5. So we're in the middle of East Midtown rezoning. We have been for five years. God, help me. Um, okay, so one thing that has happened in that process uh, is that all parties have been forced to be very explicit about the value of the historical assets, which is what 
raise the fees. Uh, so that has been good because it has forced them to, because part of what they're doing to come to the table is to negotiate using those properties as ATMs to fund uh, public infrastructure improvements. Okay, so the merits of that and how that might end up looking are a different topic, but my suggestion is that number one, we use the stated, the statements of all these parties, including Redney, everybody was at the table in uh, for our president, uh, Gail Brewer and Dan Garan on the steering committee. I was I was at the table and out of those meetings. And those were that's all public records. Those minutes can be quoted, the steering committee report can be quoted, and that is that's that was RPA, MAS, Redney, you know, the union, everybody was at that table talking about the importance and the value of the landmarks. Okay. So number one, use that, quote them, like shore up the argument using their own statements. Now that was that's East Midtown. So it is an ATM. You're unlocking value that is dollar signs. It's not abstract. It's not cultural value. So the, the Dalmatian part of me, the challenge is, well, what if we're not talking about transfer funding, air rights transfers to fund infrastructure improvements? What if we're talking about a property where nobody cares about the air rights? And that is a much uh, larger thing. But I think that you could get in there. And then I, the other thing that I would suggest is the community board uh, meetings are super important. And even if you feel that it's a small group of people all talking to each other, which sometimes it is, the public has to show up and say that they care about the items that are on the agenda at every single landmarks community meeting. The CB5 is extremely critical, I know. I'm sure it's true on other community boards. It's easy to glaze over and to not pay attention to community board agenda calendars. I really encourage everyone to do it in the board where you live and work uh, and go and talk about why you care about the, the value of those programs. What I'm hearing is a, a desire to invest more in communications, marketing, getting ideas out there, and that kind of organizing stuff of really showing up and being part of all of those regular processes. And again, in my mind, it's building an infrastructure. It's playing the long game. I mean, we're going to be here. We're going to be here when this mayor is gone, or some of us will be here when this mayor is gone. I mean, so in a sense, preservationists are already around. So we're here to to, to advance those ideas that are going to take years. Uh, you know, if we if we focus on them and advance them, decide. Uh, I'm going to be a wet blanket, but um, we weren't. What this enough. was all encouraging. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, community boards have very little power, and the thing is that has to change because the community boards are representative of the community, and they know what the community needs. And because I have gone to quite a few community board meetings, you know, to fight for landmarks and things like that. We have been successful at times, but it's a battle. Oh, yeah. But community boards have to be given more power. Well, they vary also by borough. I mean, com a community board in Manhattan has one set of individuals. Go to a qu community board in Queens, and you don't get that same kind of you, you get people who were born on the community board and are still there 80 years old, like, uh, which is what he's saying, and they love doing that. Hey, we're gonna, anyway. On hell and then around. I think we also need to advocate for a, a, a greater vision of the city. I, mean, I think we hear about preservation, and we put enough advice about not here, not here, not here. This is a perfect. But we have to really acknowledge that you know, the mayor's progressive agenda was one that probably most people in this room voted for a few years ago. And, and I think that there is a reality that has to be acknowledged in terms of what's happening in the community and the needs of the people. You know? I mean, we need more housing. I don't know how many people rent or own. So, but that vision is really lacking. And I'm not sure that we need another Robert Moses cup of a grand vision. But perhaps it's also that has to be considered in terms of trying to figure out a way that we can talk about both. Preservation and development at the same time. Uh, there and there. Well, I'm sorry, you've had one once, so a new voice. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm a resident of Harlem. I'll ignore what you've said. But more positively, um, I've attempted to work with Rebney up there, and of course, uh, I got no, nowhere, which is true with what the gentleman had said about real estate and where it's going, especially up in Harlem. But I've noticed that museums throughout the city are now setting up tours with their educated department and they realize there's money to be made and talking about the history and what was what is what about that is a possible new direction of approaching the cultural centers 
and see where their interest is in helping out. Well, partnership is good, but actually the, the tour business, as we know, is kind of started in the preservation community, lots of stuff. More partnerships. If we take the big ideas, more partnerships are good. And, and I think uh, actually through the whole Landmarks 50 activity, there were a lot of new cultural, instit cultural institutions kind of recognizing an intersection with preservation. So building the audience is always good, but I, I don't know that it's, it's another long-term strategy, which is, is not bad, but we should have. Here, and then a final, and then we'll do a wrap-up. So I think a good suggestion is maybe do a profile of the building and the residents and the storytelling. So it's, you know, the street tells a story by the architecture. And then I want to point out, I also live in Harlem, and what I've noticed is like 135th Street at the Y across the street, the other building that was owned by the Abyssinian Church, they let it rot, and then it went to foreclosure. A bank owns it now, so they drain the pool. So there was a, a pool that was for kids. You could have a birthday party. It's now empty. And the, so what, how, how do you pitch that to the newspapers to say, like, look, you know, pray all you want, but you should, maybe you shouldn't be a landlord, you know? Um, <laughs> so, ah, over, over here. <laughs> You're on. You're on. And then. I was. Yeah. Him, him yeah. Okay, you first, gonna, then him, then Dan. I was going to say, I, I'm a progressive and a real sense of progressive, and I'm very annoyed that Khmer has taken that word and duped so many people, because I'm telling you right now, it's like luxury housing. Yeah, it's luxury housing. He's, he's not talking about affordable communities. What's driving up the cost of rent in New York City is speculative speculation. People have these luxury houses, they're not paying taxes. It's happening in every single community. We have houses in Brooklyn going for $2 million. The speculation from China. You're mm -hmm. gutting the buildings. You're subdividing. We have prostitution. I'm saying to you that I am for affordable housing, but we're not getting it this way. So we have to really talk about what's really driving up the cost of housing. So we're not feeding into his words. And that's part of the problem. We're feeding into that language. He hasn't been for real estate development since he's been a city councilman. That's the truth. So I don't want us to be misled that we're going to get something we're not going to get. Also, if you talk to if you talk to affordable housing advocates and you ask for what are the 10 number one things blocking affordable housing, historic preservation I don't think would appear on that list. Okay. Right here, and then we'll let Dan have the final word because this is his party. So I mean, as the chair of HDC, he should get to speak a little. Go. Well, I want to pick up on your point and all the points that were made back here. You know, this is a different city than it was 30, 40 years ago. Uh, you know, 40 years ago, uh, the population was declining. We had high crime. It wasn't an attractive city. This is a totally different city than the one that a lot of us came to decades ago. So we have this money flowing in internationally. This is not a unique uh, situation in New York City. Look at London. Look at the San Francisco. So we're by no means alone in the real estate pressures that we're feeling. And you know, the city claims that the population is growing. We're going to be another million people in 20, 30 years. I think one of the things that perhaps we ought to think about is how can we align ourselves with the affordable housing movement in order to not just always be opposed to upzoning everywhere. I mean, the city is going to change. With all these people coming in, the city's going to change. We may not like it. Nobody likes change. But how can we as preservationists frame our argument for historic preservation in the context of where is that population going to be accommodated? And how can we join forces with other progressive elements like the affordable housing movement in order to put forth a positive vision for preservation and affordable housing? And what would that look like? Not one example of opposition to out-of-scale development has been opposition to an affordable housing complex. No one in the city is marching to block an affordable housing development because they're not being built. What they're doing is upzoning residential neighborhoods and giving developers incentive. That's the zoning for quality ZQA or whatever the hell it was. Now, what, what, as a way of summing up, you are absolutely right. When the preservation movement got going in the 1960s and 70s, New York City, London, Liverpool were all in decline. And they were bottoming out. We'd lost 700,000 people. 
in the 1970s alone in New York City. Preservation was used to stop the decay of the city. And the city supported stabilizing these neighborhoods. And those were the anchors for the recovery of New York in the decades that followed. Without those historic districts, New York City would not have uh, recovered the way it did. Today, it's not a decayed city, but a lot of people think, oh, we'll adaptively reuse these abandoned buildings. Nothing's abandoned and rotting by accident. It's rotting by plan now. What we are using preservation for is to protect the historic city from out-of-scale development. We're still doing the same thing. The target is different. So, Dan, promised you the final I think, word. first of all, President of HTC, we need new leadership. <laughs> There's a young person over here we can get in there. It's him. It? He's our newest employee, by the way. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, no, I just I wanted to say um, I was uh, taken with what Chris, I'm sorry, Christian has left because I was taken with what he said um, about hating revenue. And as an architect, I hate the AIA with every fiber of my being. And I hate giving them money, and I don't think they do anything for us. When they sent a congratulatory letter to Donald Trump uh, upon his victory, um, there was justifiable outrage among us uh, who paid them a great deal of money. Um, I like the idea of warming our way on the inside. Rebney, I don't know if people know, Rebney is in the old GE building. They're in an individually designated land. <laughs> Their offices are really nice. Um, and uh, we have in architecture an alternative uh, group, Sarah, the Society of American Minister of Architects, which was formed basically in reaction to the, the AIA. When we were doing our work to get testimonial letters from various groups in favor of preservation, among the groups that we approached were real estate people, and we got some. We got some from Sunnyside Gardens. But most people were too afraid to put pen to paper. We got testimonial letters from unions, from the bricklayers' unions, and the unions have typically shown up to oppose preservation, but we couldn't get much from the brick real estate community. But I feel like they are indeed, in some ways, or their organization, not them, are, are one of our major foes. Absolutely. Not them, because so many real estate people, and some of them are on our board, recognize the value of historic districts to them. And if we can get those people to, to perhaps even form an alternate society, Maybe we can do something about about uh, sapping the power of revenue to mess with us. Well, maybe the first step really is that we, as Tony sort of said, go where the money is. Where is the money? How's it being spent? Who's donating? I mean, the whole that whole process. One, I, I, I just want to say one more thing. Yo, you're the boss. The other thing that I'm not the boss. <laughs> yeah. uh, one other thing that I do is I'm, I've been for many years now the head of the public review committee, and I want to say. With the exception of Christopher Goff and the Society for the Architecture of the City, um, we are the only people there now. Um, no one else shows up. Barbara is here, right? Barbara, am I wrong? Yeah. I'm not wrong. So you say right? HTC. HTC is the only people that show up every time. And our public review committee meets, now they're making us meet every Friday. Some of us think it's an effort to finally break our spirit because it's easy to justify every other Friday to your business partners. It ain't easy to justify every Friday to your business partners. But what I'm saying is, if I can urge people in this room to do one thing, is to show up, have your group show up, show up at public review, which is typically the Friday before each Tuesday, show up and make sure that the Landmarks Commission, and by, by virtue of them, the city government knows that we still care. And by, by not using this avenue that, that is still left open to us, we are, we are missing an opportunity to make our voice heard. So that's the other, last, that's the I last think our timekeeper would tell me we're out of time. But I, what I, I hope that though we've had a good amount of bitch and moaning, which is very therapeutic for the community, I think also there's some ideas and directions that we really have to figure out how we can, how we can change. Because what we're doing now isn't working. And I think some, there were some good ideas here of ideas of, of directions we can go. So we shouldn't give up hope. But I think we have, this is a time we've got to double down. And, and, and also, I just want to urge, think long term. We need to get that proactive agenda. I mean, let's push for demolition tax. Let's get a mansion tax. I mean, totally unpopular at the moment, but in 10 years or 15 years, they might be real. On that note, we will leave the Alamo in its pristine setting with no bodies lying around.
Uh, and certainly no preservationists lying around. So thank everybody for coming. Thank you.